welcome to the eighth episode of Music Mates, a podcast where I sometimes pick two albums from the 1990s and the usual group talk about them. (laughs) Today we have an interesting album to talk through, just the one this episode, of which is by an alternative rock band integral to the music scene of the last 25 years. Their style and tone have had multiple transformations since their inception, all the way to their most recent work. Um, This album is released on the 21st of May, 1997. Um, it was the third by the band and arguably the most critically acclaimed by the group, which started off by leading the Britpop movement of the mid-90s and then deciding to take more of a unique experimental turn with this album in the latter half of the decade and for the remainder of their career as well. Um, preceded by Pablo Honey and the Benz and succeeded by albums that aren't important, I've probably given away, it's OK Computer. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much... Pablo Honey is like the worst radio. That's album. not true. Sure. It's one of the best ones from what I've heard. Just because it's got creep on it. I don't really like creep. It's, it's, it's the other song. Exactly. It? It's about it. <laughs> nah. They're, they're not that good. Uh, um, although for most people, the Benz was their introduction with the band, Radiohead as a concept emerged much earlier in the mid 80s. Each member of the band went to Oxfordshire's Abingdon School. Ed O'Brien on guitar and Phil Selway on drums were the oldest, followed by Tom York, who's known primarily for vocals as well as backup guitar and piano, and Colin Greenwood on bass. Getting together, they began with the name On A Friday, famously created because that was the day they would rehearse on, and later on, Colin invited his brother into the band, Johnny, on another guitar. However, by 1987, <laughs> however, by 1987 everyone had left the university bar Johnny, and it wasn't until 1991 when the band reunited and began gigging together regularly around Oxford. The record label EMI became interested in their demo and eventually signed them on, urging them to change their name. On a Friday, became Radiohead after the group were inspired by a Talking Heads song with the same name, a huge influence in their music style. The band's first hit and undoubtedly most famous song by Miles was Creep. However, this wasn't always the case. When it was originally released as a single in 1992, the song barely made it on the charts. It was slagged by music reviews and radio stations didn't really play it. Even with the release of Pablo Honey in 1993 led to no avail. However, the song started to get some traction, originally in Israel, weirdly enough, and then especially in the United States, which in the early 90s was going through an alternative rock boom and creep fit that tone perfectly. The song then became more famous in the UK as a result, and the band instantly became more well-known, giving them a level of of success they could not handle. The idea that this band was a bit of a one-hit wonder came to fruition over the next year, leading the band more anxiously to want to write new material to discount that claim. In 1984, the band released the single My Own Lung, which, while not as critically acclaimed as Creep, still proved the band had more than just a one-hit wonder and gave a good taste of what the band's sound would be like on their next album. The Benz was released in 1995. (laughs) The Benz, release was, yeah. the Benz was released in 1995 to instant success and love. It was densely packed with content that gave the band an entirely new look and sound while still being attached to the roots of Pablo Honey. Radiohead's rise may be linked partially to the Britpop movement, and I stress the word partially because their music is much more diverse, fascinating and exceeding in technical artistry than the music of bands like Blur and particularly Oasis. <laughs> okay. I had to say it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> songs like Fake Plastic Trees, High and Dry and Street Spirit Fade Out in particular were huge hits with the last one they with the last one there reaching number 5 on the UK oh, charts. The group went on to tour this album with yeah. R.E.M. in 1995 and Alanis Morissette in 1996. At this point the, bega- the band began to produce new material with their producer Nigel Godrich who was a sound engineer on the Benz. Working on singles they produced Lucky which ended up being on Warchild's charity album called The Help. Exit Music for a Film was also an early track which later showed up in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Then Radiohead went and released OK Computer, a pivotal landmark point in their career. Paranoid Android in particular garnered them with a level of of success unrivaled in the charts by any other song they've released to date, reaching number three. Other than Paranoid Android, other tracks like Karma and Police and No Surprises were released as singles. The influence that OK Computer went on to have on music, not just in the late 90s but still today, can't be expressed. All the usual stuff like sales and critically acclaimed, but so much more. The album regularly features very highly on magazines and music critics' best album of all time. Um, and OK Computer proved you could combine electronics with rock in a way that hadn't really been done before in such a way in the modern age. The album debuted at number one in the UK and earned a Grammy for best alternative album. It created this shift that brought popular rock music away from Britpop to more atmospheric alternative, which was more prevalent in the next decade. OK Computer is an album that actually feels like it has world building. It describes a world of 
total social social alienation, rampant. Makes you feel like Batman. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> it describes a world of total social alienation, rampant consumerism, and political dissatisfaction. For this reason, OK Computer is often cited as being an early onlook into the mood and ambience of the 21st century. Radiohead became the David Bowie and Pink Floyd of their generation, even though they have denied often inspiration from Pink Floyd's art rock 1970s classic, The Dark Side of the Moon. The band represented a culture of experimentation and boundary jumping musical genius that you don't find nowadays in the pop industry. And no one's pushing the medium like this band started to and then did later on in the uh, 21st century. With an initial sound combining the grungy sound of Nirvana and Pablo Honey with the harsh sound of the Pixies, all the way to a new, utterly unique sound that came to define the band completely. They did other stuff after OK Computer, but we don't talk about that on media. The track listing on OK Computer includes Airbag, Parallel Android, Subterranean Homestead Alien, Exit Music for a Film, Let Down, Karma Police, Bitter Happier, Electioneering, Plumbing Up the Walls, No Surprises, Lucky, and finally The Tourist. Right. Enough about me. Let's get started. So, airbag. <laughs> well, enough from me. I, I am really. <laughs> I, I suppose I've put a lot of myself in that introduction. It's not just um, yeah, me reading up the biography, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You are, you are Mr. Really Ed. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> it's the only reason why we yeah, like it's, this. It's uh, strange this though, band, how many? You know, it's, it's just this does have like overlapping names. It's got a Johnny. It's got an O'Brien. <laughs> the only reason um, Ethan likes this album is because um, Johnny Greenwood wrote the score for that. I think but, not. Um, oh. <laughs> that's that's the real only Harry, reason. Well, now you've cracked it. I, I just don't have a reason to stay on and, and give my my four five pages of notes about why it's so good that it's still to come. You've got it. There will be blood, so that's it. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll begin with Airbag, um, which is... Um, yeah, the main notes I have is just sort of about what the songs are about, rather than the sort of musical things they, they use in them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's um, sort of about how uh, Tom York was in a car crash and, you know, his life was saved by an airbag. Um, so there's a quote um, that he's said about this song, which is, I was really frightened by cars back then, but airbag was almost the opposite of that. If you get into a crash or potentially disastrous situation and walk away, you feel a thousand times more alive, regardless of what that is. It's more about that. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think it's it's not the only song on the album that talks about um, a transportation and even features transportation in the music videos. Um, I know that <laughs> we I'm will talk about the music videos. Tony. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the tourist, um, which is the <laughs> final song on the album, does have um, that as a key oh, theme as well. And I, I like the fact that it kind of bit. creates this nice cyclic loop lyrically through the track listing. Where I think um, uh, it's lucky it's is lucky yeah, like lucky is yeah. the uh, it's a, it's the same song, but it's about a plane crash. <laughs> uh, mm. it literally, no, I, has the same meaning. Well, if, if, if it's lucky, I, I think I think the tourist is the same as well. Hang on, let me let me get back to you on that. Someone nah, else. I, I think. Nah. <laughs> uh, the only other note I have for this song is just jackknife. <laughs> it's just you know, I mean, <laughs> well, I would. I I was gonna say that it's interesting that going into this album we've we've started with sort of the intent and the law and the item descriptions behind all the meaning of like the lyrics mm. since for me personally I tell you, I, I do I do agree that the album, album unless you set out to deliberately read the lyrics the song, a lot of lyrics you just cannot really hear, hear what he was talking uh, about. either because of the mix or the fact that Tom York just can't pronounce the words I think it's more that um, I, w I wouldn't really and maybe it is to do with the sound mixing so much but but I think especially on this album yeah. and going forward which is a reason why after this after this <laughs> album in particular, I don't really tend to listen to much of their music. But his voice just gets whinier and whinier to the point that 
whatever he says just sounds incomprehensible to me. So I completely agree. If, if you want to know the lyrics of the song, you have to search them up. A lot of the time, it's it's mm-hmm. very kind of like, yeah, not really pronounced. <laughs> That's the other impressive thing yeah. is that like a lot of these songs are pushing on five minutes, some of them above, <laughs> and yet you like yeah. when you look at the lyrics, it's like yeah, so there's like three verses. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> there is so little written. Yeah, it's it takes so long to say a sentence that. And also so much instrumental parts that, like, <laughs> yeah, there's like very little it's stretched out across all of these songs. Mm. Yeah, there's often there's often a chorus that's <laughs> like repeated and very clear, and a lot of the verses can kind of blur into the background. And um, this is like I'll, I'll just go out and say this is probably like my favorite album. You'd be a it's horrible the only one podcaster. I've listened to like, more than once. Um, <laughs> and uh, I I don't particularly I've learned from mm. kind of thinking about it a lot the last few days and reading about the songs, I don't tend to enjoy, like, analysing lyrics and breaking down what is, like, meant by the songs. Because <laughs> when I listen to them, like, they, they all evoke such a particular kind of feeling and mood. I mean, uh, Air- Airbag, when you find out, like, the, the kind of literal story behind it, it does make sense. But the line in Airbag saved my life, you know, and it, I'm back to save the universe, this kind of renewed hope are very clear. But it's, I think, I feel like that emotion kind of comes through more with the music. And I can't believe we haven't said, like, I think me and Ethan talk about it a lot. The, uh, the the opening kind of few notes of the song are very kind of iconic. Mm. Um, it's it's such a great. One. Whenever I hear that, I know I'm in for a, a treat, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I also like this is right at the end of the song, but there's, there's, there's like a three little beats that kind of lead it perfectly into Paranoid Android. Yeah, and I, I, and, I uh, think kind of those uh, those beeps are also at, at the same mm-hmm. tempo as Paranoid Android. It's almost like a count into the next song. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it and it's kind of I I feel like what makes this album so good for me personally is the fact that it feels like a very cohesive experience um it, it's kind of it's like that dark side of the moon or like sergeant pepper thing where uh, the the progression of the songs is very deliberate and evokes us it tells a story almost um so i feel like listening to it in order kind of is, is great and uh, airbag leading its paranoid android it's, it's 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 a pretty strong way to start an album personally i think uh, airbag is a great song yeah i completely agree should we uh, move on to paranoid android uh, I guess just if anyone else has nothing else to say about airbag. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, who wants to talk about this one then? Yeah, I'm good. Um, so, uh, Tony, do you want to say something? Only 50 minutes. <laughs> okay, well. We'll start by the first time I was introduced to this song. So tell me, you know, I, I, I am not a big Radiohead fan. Haven't really listened to much of their work before this. <laughs> but listening to this song the first time was when Ethan showed us the music video, which I'll be honest, has kind of tainted my perception of the song. Um, it kind of just fills me with a with a sense of uh, unbridled rage, really, because the music video just kind of it's 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 kind of like I get what Ethan was saying when when he's talking about the world building this album sort of conjures up, and the fact that it's meant to be this sort of sense of like I don't know, uh, like you know it comes in a lot uh, more obviously later on when there's a song called Electioneering. You know you, you get what this is saying, but but I I don't know the mm. way that the visuals of the um, music video convey it, they're just kind of gross and kind of just don't really even sound like what the song is and i think i feel like to point it up now yeah Yeah, you mean the album cover right yeah cover art uh sort of translate that a lot better if this is actually the cover art the one that's like the road you know what i'm talking about right (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. i feel yeah i feel like that sort of balance of yeah, yeah that's what i mean that sort of balance of colors works a lot better than the just like ms paint yeah. fucking paint fill tool default red and yellow and green that they've got splurted everywhere it's just not fun it's not fun but the song though uh, i guess i'll kind of agree with harry what he, or was it ethan who said it earlier that i feel like in these earlier songs the voice is just kind of a bit whiny to me but i do like how the song sort of nice. picks up can we do the music video thing now there is a is that... cool okay yeah, we can talk about it now. sort of comes in in the like later <laughs> half i quite like 
That's yeah, can I can I give my side of the argument? Because I'm I've controversially have been the champion of all music videos yeah, are bad. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing so it. <laughs> we're going to talk about our music videos. All right, so my feeling bad. with music videos in general, and specifically the three from this album, is I don't know how you guys think. I no one can know how anyone thinks. I don't know how mm. your brains work. If when you listen to music, you think about you think you can try and interpret music in terms of like the words that are being spoken. If you create images, if it's colors. I don't know how you perceive music. So it's, it's a hard conversation. But all I know is that the images and colours that kind of come into my head when I listen to a song and the mood they're trying to convey are something that mm-hmm. I find very personal. And like I, I like to, when I'm listening to music, kind of come up completely with my own meanings and interpretations. And whatever I'm doing in my life, wherever I am, I feel like they can, they can sometimes make the music better or worse. And that's just how I listen to music. So when I get shown like this is, a, this is like an image, it kind of like, it feels like it taints it. It taints that kind of, that pure like my own yeah. interpretation of the song and when when I it's something is like that. like this music video in particular is so bad and i hate that when i hear the song i do <laughs> think about it a little bit and i'm like oh it's kind of ruined it a little bit i wish i could kind See, of I, yeah, have my own interpretation and like, i get that you can just ignore it but sometimes when it's mm. you can't, <laughs> it's really annoying yeah, yeah. Well, i think it's because i have a quite good separation between what a song is to me and what a music video is showing like i know when i'm looking at a music video i'm probably looking at what some other random dude who is it's what their take on the lyrics is it's not even necessarily the take of the like writer of that song that like, it's sort of understanding it's like the difference between um like i don't know reading the lord of the rings and then watching the film and then sort of going oh there's there are some differences here it doesn't mm the thing I imagine in the book is that's sort of different to what, what is shown here and also the thing I'm thinking is different from you know when it was initially written then oh this person's gone and done a fan art where he's drawn Gandalf in this certain way it's like there's no we're in the, we're surrounded by these completely different takes associated with these things and you just kind of have to mm. like accept that I don't know it no, I know it's, it's interesting because I see what you're saying, but at the same time, that's something that doesn't happen with me. They're two quite separate entities. Yeah, I get it. I just I don't I I would like to avoid music videos if possible. I think uh, largely their 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 purpose kind of culturally was that MTV was a music television station, so they had to find a way to visualize music, and I think music videos largely kind of boomed because of uh, first like VHSs and then uh, MTV like massively spurred them to popularity. To the point now where music videos are completely pointless. Like, there's there's literally no need for them. So that kind of annoys me. Um, I, I guess there are some ones. Like, I really like the one for... Um, is it Just? Yeah. yeah, I really like the one for that. But that's just because it's, like, funny. And the song is kind of funny as well. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, these kind of work well together. You know, it's, like, separate things. But uh, specifically, the animation in this one. I get that it's supposed to be shit. But it just... Oh, it just... It hurts me. Um, and this song is kind of like it, it has a lot of like violent, like disgusting elements to it. But it's like it's a different kind of violent, disgusting, the one that's being perceived in the video. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like yeah, I feel I like that. Ethan, you probably have things to the say. The music video it. makes it yeah, sound. Yeah, I would makes say that I'm definitely like a more, more on the side of Jonathan here. Song. But that's not to say that Which, I, yeah, I disagree like. with what you're saying, Harry, or what Tony's saying. I completely see every reason and just all the backing that you have behind your opinion. Um, but I think I'm someone who doesn't really, similarly to Jonathan, I, I don't really struggle to see them as two separate things um, that could sometimes be brought together to create. Um, something or well, just something full stop um i think that i think that when i listen to a song i don't really think of the music video and i guess what it comes down to is w- whether you want to leave something to your imagination or not and per- personally when i listen to uh, paranormal android um what i have in my head similarly to you harry is the my own emotions that get conjured up as a result of that and the kind of textures that I see and feel um, that aren't really anything like the music video. I think it's just nice to see uh, an added element to it, especially in the case of this song where you have a scene that takes place um, in a bar. And I think York came out and said um, that the inspiration for this song was due to a lot of things. But one time he went to L.A. and um, 
you went to a bar and you had a really unpleasant experience. And I think that in the yeah, yes. exactly. And I think there's an interesting actually. I'll I'll read yeah, it out now yeah. that you brought it up. There was something from a website they used to have called Radiohead.com, and there was this section written about this song. Um, sort of in slightly bad English, no capital letters, uh, spelling mistakes and stuff like that. So it goes, Paranoid Android. In a bar in Hollywood, the centre of the Western universe, standing at the bar, social drinking, after doing the talk show bit. Do you want to know this? <laughs> this is what we aspire to, is it? It is dark. There is a woman opposite me who is as socially anorexic as her poodle. She looks desolate in her makeup and lost eyes. Next to her husband, boyfriend is persuading a younger fleshed half his age stewardess to come back to the hills to their mansion to sample his wine. She looks at him like he's a character in a Hammer House horror. One of our four, one of our friends spills a glass of wine over a vacuum packed Gucci outfit complete with matching white handbag. The witch goes crazy. We think it's funny until we see the evil in her eyes. My friend is asked to leave. The Gucci creature is the closest thing I have seen to the devil. <laughs> The woman is possessed. I cannot sleep that night, asking what we've got ourselves into. Voices <laughs> talking like fax machines, hissing and spitting like demons. This is the master race, Gucci and now I'm part creature. of it. Anyway, you didn't want to know that. <laughs> uh, they were high on cocaine and went into a bar and <laughs> saw a woman there, spilled a drink on her, and she got angry. Mm. That's that's the backstory to the song. <laughs> That's, that's pretty funny, I'll be honest. I think that conveys what they're going for in the music video a lot better, just the the way it's written, because I get what they're trying to go for. They're trying to show, what, what is it, Hollywood is this like really gross thing and place with gross people in it. But I feel like you can show gross things in a way that isn't gross, you know? You can, you can make it, you can like almost flip it on its head my Whereas feeling is the they music do, video I mean, is just like, oh, this is just a weird, thing, blobby looking the motherfucker. Music who video looks uh, offensive to your eyeballs. Um, uh, that is sort of very good and it's kind uh, of disquieting in nature and is better to look at. <laughs> mm. what, what, what I... Should we actually talk about the song? Well, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get to finish what I wanted to say like a minute ago. Hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, no, uh, we, I want to. I want to yeah, wait. Basically, wait, what, what I was going to finish off by saying. All right, all right. Um, we need to, we, we're having, having the music video discussions first. We have, have to discuss nice every music. Where video. basically, um, <sighs> Harry is right. I'm sure there have been plenty of music videos out there that have been directed or written by people that are rem aren't even really remotely connected to the band. But I am hundred percent sure that the members of Radiohead would have had a massive influence over that music video and all of their music videos. And I, and I think when you hear a story like that, when you hear an account of what happened to someone, especially to someone as interesting and fascinating as Tom York, it's nice to have some form of, of what, it, what it felt like to be in that situation, to be him. And I think the music video conveys the sense of being in a completely bizarre situation, not really knowing what to do and feeling just the chaos happening all around him and all the madness. And I think I think the music video captures that. It's nice to have some something there that that I'm sure that I'm sure Tom York had um, influence over. It, but basically, what what I'm trying to say, it, it's nice to have artists take on what it is that they're singing, so you can kind of get a separate image in your head as well. If that makes sense. Mm. The thing I enjoy with this written up uh, account here is just the ending with anyway, you didn't want to know that. Um, I <laughs> yeah. find that that's a very powerful line to finish on. Gucci creature. Yeah. It's, mm. it's probably the most okay computery thing I have ever heard. That Jonathan yeah. just read out. It's, it's, yeah. It, that's good. yeah, but we, we can talk about the song. It's, it's, it's um, quite a nice paragraph. Off, I mean, and... This is the most okay yeah. computery Interesting song short story. <laughs> So much so that I often call this album Paranoid yeah, Android. you know, I've started getting in the habit as well of doing that. I almost did it a few minutes ago. I almost called the album Paranoid Android without even realising it because of you. Yeah. 
So in my attempts to like look into the lyrics, I realized I didn't actually know what he was saying for like half of the song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of lyrics. I'm like, like there's a line about like yuppies. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> that, that's a line. Um, so yeah, this song is like very much the like very long <laughs> song made up of different parts that like people just say is like the best one because it's like long. So it's like it's the stairway to heaven. It's the Bohemian Rhapsody. It really yeah, is the yeah. one that's it's just. A... Description Tom York has uh, said is it was fifty percent Bohemian Rhapsody. If I could ever get that many vocals <laughs> together, and fifty percent happiness is a warm gun. It's just it's it's that like epic song, which is kind of like I get why p- if people don't like it. Um, I can't believe that this was a single as well. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> uh, outside of the context of listening to this album, I can't imagine like f- coming across this song and liking it. But uh, I think it really kind of summarizes the. Uh, what they were going for with the uh, the fusion of kind of um the the rock that came from the earlier albums that um Cher from Clueless didn't like you know that Paul Rudd was listening to <laughs> before uh, they, they start dating even though they're their step brother and sister um and the kind of weird uh, electric sound they go for in the later albums and it comes together this perfect moment of like 1997 Tony Blair's just been elected you know technology's on the rise Radiohead are about to become the biggest band in the world, except they deliberately like sabotage themselves by making like weird albums, which I kind of respect. Um, and it's it's this this album that I would kind of call science fiction, um, which is really strange. Uh, it kind of loses that sound a little bit through, but I think this and the next song together kind of create <laughs> this this great this futuristic sound and this sound of uh, being alienated in the modern world, which kind of sounds slightly off. Um, the fusion of uh, all the different kind of parts of the song coming together. The, uh, the, the kind of weird way the vocals are sung, which I really like. Um, there's some sounds in this album and in this song in particular that I just don't know what they are. Um, I don't know what instruments are being played to kind of create the, these effects. And I, I think that's great. It's also got that bit where he just starts shouting, you don't remember, <laughs> which I like doing because uh, it annoys Ethan a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a really great song. It used to be yeah. my favourite, but, uh, but then they changed. I want to say that apart from maybe a few cases <laughs> most of the sounds on this album will just be guitars but with a lot of effects pedals messing around with delay and, and reverb and chorus and, and things like that so uh, for, for an album it's got that bjork thing of just throwing a lot of sounds together that probably shouldn't work and i can imagine don't work for a lot of people's <laughs> ears but for some reason like the, the weird contrast of them for me just like it gives me like this this kind of feeling. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. This, this, this is this is there's, great. There's, I like there's... this. This is like a um a sci-fi album, but it's also mm. set in like the nineties Britain. It's perfect. There's definitely something very dissonant about Radiohead. And if someone was to come up to me and say they they're not a massive fan of the band, I and mean, then they would have to explain themselves. I think I'd all already know what they're talking about. And I think I have a lot of that on their music after this album, where it where I I, I like experimentation, but. But my problem is is that with experimentation, you still need like a hook or um, or some rhythm or something to latch onto. And uh, from the work that I've listened to after this album, it, it's just lacking that. And what they're really going for, it, I mean, if, if it's what they're going for, then that's fair enough. But what what they have is a combination of sounds that they put together, and, and sure, it it sounds really nice. But there, but there isn't a rhythm punching through, and there isn't there isn't something that I feel like I can just kind of grasp onto, and it will take me through the song. Um, that it doesn't really have a drive to it, and that's that's mostly my problem. And I feel like um, with a lot of songs on this album as well, with Power Android, I mean, there are sounds that could really just like if you were a certain kind of person. I think if you were most people, to be honest, listening to it, you would just you would just think, what are all these screechy sounds going on? They're just making my ears bleed and I, re- I just wouldn't blame you for thinking that but i guess if you're, if you're a radiohead fan you're you're into that sort of thing <laughs> i think um another reason people might not like it which may mm. even be the biggest reason people don't like radiohead mm-hmm. is the reason that share doesn't like it in uh Clubbers. and it's just it's very like not depressing it's very kind of um i don't know it's not nihilist it's it's quite oh, i can't find the word but it's 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 very much like Duma music. No, I, I kind of um, know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I feel like the more I try and like listen to the lyrics and like read what they're going for, I'm like, I think I like this album less and less the more I'm learning about it. Because the uh, yeah, pieces yeah. of music that I interpret to be the more uplifting parts of the album and take away is almost the uh, the kind of uh, well, there is a couple of uplifting songs, but I'm like, actually, that their true deeper meaning is just like even more depressing. Uh, 
Mm, it's uh, something my brother said that stuck with me uh, ages ago, which is you can't listen to three Radiohead songs in a row without feeling depressed. Yeah. And uh, mm. that's that's something I very much feel as well. I sort of went through a period where I listened a lot to the Benz and um, a, what, a bit from OK Computer, but not so much. And then sort of went, <laughs> mm, no, this isn't helping <laughs> and sort of had to move away. Yeah, it's definitely not one like you can listen to it. I often listen to it and then won't listen to it again for like a you know yeah. a couple of months. It's kind of it's it's it, it's, yeah. it's like watching a, a kind of depressing film in, in that sense. And yeah. I think um, for me, it's the complete opposite. Where this song is is just country miles far and away the one that I've listened to the most so many times, even though it's the longest song on the album. And um, and the reason I know of this song is because of Johnny. Actually, um, he recommended me the music video. <laughs> And I'm not, not even kidding. It was um, <gasps> it was in a GCSE it's maths hot. lesson years ago, and you, I I kind of knew vaguely of Radiohead at the time because my parents are really into their first two albums. Not really OK Computer so much. Definitely not anything after OK Computer. Um, and then you just are your parents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. And then Jonathan came up to me and said, "Oh, hey, I, we were talking about something. He didn't just bring it up out of the blue, but he said, oh, yeah, you should listen to so and so.' Yeah, I think we were talking about music. Videos. Yeah. yeah, and I went away <laughs> and listened to it, and I was like, yeah. yeah, this this song is really, really good.' And then I just gradually started listening to more and more by the band until I today I would consider them one of my favorites, which is weird because I don't really like yeah. their most of their music, <laughs> which which is the funny thing because I like their first three albums and they've done another six since, and I, I've because I've I've gotten kind of bored listening to a computer on repeat so much for this podcast. I thought, well, now's the perfect time to go and actually listen to some of them, some of their stuff from the two thousands and even two thousand tens, um, and I'm getting into it a little bit more, but I think it's still going to take me quite a while and it's just funny to call them one of my favorite bands and i i don't even like the majority of their music <laughs> i mean i call myself a star wars fan yeah, so, you yeah, know, yeah. It's, it's the same difference yeah most of star wars films are bad <laughs> yeah yeah there there are like two good films in that series yeah yeah, I I, I kind of want to jump in a bit, talking about more more of Radiohead's overall like sort of vibe they're going for, and I I don't know about you guys, but I sort of like listen to music as sort of like a way to sort of like make me mm. put me in make certain relax, states of mind. Study, you know? So <laughs> I will listen to really headphones. upbeat music when I want to be upbeat, and re- listen to really chill music when I want to be chill. If that makes sense, right? Yeah, I listen to lo-fi hip hop beats, and that's that's exactly right. And for me, uh, watching this, like speaking of politics, speaking of dyst- the dystopian future that we live in now, that this that this album predicted, it made me think of the uh, Chapo Trap House meme, which is Elizabeth Warren, and it's people it's like a survey result about her. It's like forty four percent saying like too liberal and the other 44 percent saying like not liberal enough i feel like that's sort of like it's it it's like that where it's hit that midpoint of not being kind of lo-fi enough not being kind of upbeat enough that that i don't really see like i don't know i feel like some songs kind <laughs> of kind of um, more one way or the other, but some of the early songs, yeah. like Paranoia totally and Android and Airbag, yeah, yeah, yeah. like really like, put today, me in like, like a weird fugue state like, where I don't know what, what I'm going to be doing, you know, like, okay. listening to yeah, them. Yeah, as, as the album if that makes sense. got that's more and more relevant, I guess it got less and less kind of fun to listen to until the point now that we're kind of past the future it's predicting, and we're like, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, this this is this is just kind of reveling in misery a little bit. At least it's like, at least this song is like, it's like old boy. It might be like, and roveling in like misery, yeah. but at least it's kind of like entertaining. Yeah, they really, operatic. I'm like, yeah, I can get behind <laughs> the the aesthetics yeah, yeah. of enjoying this. Yeah, I mean, there there are different 
definitely some songs that I am. Um, How did you feel about the of? subterranean but, um, hexagalian turning? Because I kind of just personally, I think that's almost the inverse it, of the song. It, sometimes it just hits um, that midpoint. It's, it's maybe trying to like achieve a lot of the same lost. kind of goals, but yeah. it's uh, it, it feels completely different and it's like texture. Hang on, just one second before we move on to that one, which I imagine you want to. Is it okay if I just talk about one last thing really quickly on this song? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask Jonathan if he knew about um, all the yeah, Hitchhiker's think... Guide to the Galaxy stuff that's in this song. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it, it references <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and not just with the title, but possibly also with the line about um, being shot up against a wall. Um, that's something that's from from that. Yeah. That, that's one of the notes I have. Yeah. And yeah. also, it's possible. Um, like the whole kind of android thing and the ending where it's talking about the rain down that could be a reference to blade runner and the whole like like tears in the rain sort of bit um yeah th- those are the two potential references i think that are that are in there mm, but i mean the yeah. hitchhiker's one is much more on the nose because yeah, you know it's the name of the song <laughs> it's called paranoid androids um another fun thing um i uh yeah this um, song is used as the ending theme for the anime series Ergo Proxy. I have no idea what that show is, <laughs> but this is the ending credits song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a quick look on Crunchyroll. I haven't, um, it has I like I've heard the name, but I haven't 60, seen it. Oh, 17 you know what, I think reviews. that's a, probably a good excuse to so watch it. it. Pretty really much all of them are five star. Who knows? Could be good. I like the um, idea that it plays the song in its entirety, like at the end of every episode. <laughs> it's just a really slow credit. Yeah, yeah. Damn. I think that w- that would be great for like. <laughs> well, it's it's like how anime has that thing where it will it will bleed in the ending or the opening. It's like Hanoka. Right? It just takes up but the this whole, like, song is so the fucking end. long. It happens like four minutes before the, the show is ready to end. <laughs> yeah, you have you have like a really long opening and a really long. I think ending. there's an early version and of this the, song. The episode of the anime is like minutes long as time, well. so it's like, just as one has right, This is like the apocalypse out, now. The other starts it's fading. Too long. <laughs> Tony, what do you think of sub three and Hemsic Alien? Happy. Jesus. Jesus age Christ. Yeah, I, I think that one that is one of the ones that is definitely more chill. So I think I that's one that I could put into and be like, okay, I am relaxed listening to this. It's not it's not giving me a weird sort I think, of I think panic, it's pretty uh, flight or flight response. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it's it, it kind of but, uh, the title of yeah, I, I, I quite like the idea one, of um, but I, being, I didn't have much to say. Subterranean Hemsic Alien, it, someone yeah. who's almost like living yeah, safely in suburbia, which I think is boring and is kind of yearning for something else, but is also kind of um <laughs> so it's about their that perhaps they're an alien, they're feeling alienated. They kinda of wanna leave, but they also think that the experience will kind of leave them even further kind of disconnected, which is when you look into the lyrics, very depressing. Um, and also very David Lynch. Um, <laughs> but also um, the song, it, it feels like, it feels chill, you know? Um, I, li- I like, mm. I like the, the, I think I was just glancing at the fucking like lyrical and one of those websites that breaks down lyrics. I saw them say that Close Encounters of the Third Kind mm, was yeah. kind of an inspiration yeah, on this definitely. song, which is really mm. cool because it's a film that uh, uses music a lot as well. Uh, I'm sure Johnny and Ethan have the notes for this one, so if they, those guys want to take it. Yeah, them. Johnny, do you want to go? Not got very many. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. So one of my personal notes is just it, it has this great, gentle, relaxed, detached feel. Um, and it's kind of, I don't know, the stuff I saw is implying more it's sort of kind of wanting to be abducted and just being able to view the world from a sort of detached viewpoint without really having a stake in it, a sort of much more gentle and, and listing sort of life um but yeah they accidentally deleted uh three seconds of tom york playing a few bars that apparently sounded really great um and they never quite managed to recapture that moment mm. um yeah th- those are the notes yeah. i have um I, I've, I've got a couple um mm-hmm. there's th- there are there are two here from york um one of them is he said this he he had this to say about the song. Um, 
The first oh. essay I ever wrote in school was, you are an alien from another planet, you have landed, and you are standing in the middle of Oxford and write an essay about what you see if you're an alien fo- from another planet. How would you see these people? And that's where a lot of it came from, really. Um, and, um, mm. I mean, we, we all had that, didn't we? Like, when we were younger, we all had that kind of, oh, mm. if you're an alien, how would you describe Maidenhead? Or, or what, what would you say about the people around you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've been um, doxxed, Clarence. There was this other one that made me laugh us. quite, quite oh, um, now that, now loudly that when I read it. Uh, and um, where York from, said, even? well, apparently an influence of the song was when Tom York was driving down a country road one time and hit a pheasant. And when he left his car to investigate, he began thinking about alien abduction, which I, I think is really, really funny. <laughs> the oh, scatterbrain. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> It's just mad. This guy's mad. <laughs> yeah. So the way that, like, going into most of these, and it's just the way, like, yeah, Tom Tom York had this weird <laughs> feeling. Um, like, pretty much all of these are Tom York stuff until we get to the tourist, and then um, that was uh, mostly, yeah, I think that was mostly <laughs> Greenwood that came up with the idea. Yeah. But, and then Tom York comes in and like writes it all, and then comes up with his own ideas on it. It's just like, okay. Mm. <laughs> Um, Radiohead is just Tom York, just just having weird, just having thoughts. weird thoughts. Is this is this the pictures thing? Is this the what? No. You know the thing that um, oh, gosh, where Tom York yeah. draws pictures, <laughs> gives them to Johnny Greenwood, and Johnny Greenwood just plays a piece of music he's already composed. I was like, well done, Tom. Well done. <laughs> like, you know, that picture really helped inspire the music. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I just Can remember talk- you telling me that one time laughing because it was kind of funny have we talked about the fact that this album was like produced in like a giant mansion they lived in like yeah for like a year it was um it was pretty i actually read this somewhere it was produced in um in jane seymour's house who as not not king henry's the what king henry's wife jane seymour but um <laughs> she was an actress and she was actually in live and let die she plays solitaire which was a film we were watching um only a couple of weeks ago actually in uh in sheffield um just, just a strange place yeah. to make i just love i love the fact that um uh, he kind of like Tom York was feeling incredibly alienated from traveling a lot and then just on the modern world so they decide to isolate themselves in a giant fucking mansion <laughs> just like Daniel please <laughs> <laughs> write this like mad album um, yeah um, before we move on to the next song yeah, oh Tony <laughs> <clears throat> I got he He's he's surviving COVID nineteen. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't even. I mean, he, it he's talking about it in this album. You just can't understand. Can you imagine if Radiohead had predicted that. <laughs> no, it was just a song that was like called <clears throat> Coronavirus. Yeah, uh, really quickly before we move on to the next song. Uh, uh, one thing I think we already touched upon a little bit um, was <laughs> about world building and just kind of creating this collage of just really really insane sounds that sound fantastic when blown together. And I think actually what this song goes to show really quite well is is how psychedelic and dreamlike this album can be at times. Um, I mean, we talked about the opening riff and how kind of chilled out it is, and it messes a lot with reverb and delay. Um, and I think it just creates this really surreal atmosphere. And um, I, I kind of get a similar reaction to it sometimes. That I, I We already talked about Bjork, because I think she's a really good reference point for anything that's experimental now, just because we did her on the podcast. And... Um, <laughs> and also Kasabian's debut album, which we'll uh, come to record about at some point, where I feel like you you just step into this completely alien world and you just get introduced to these really hypnotic sounds. <laughs> and that's what I get with so much of this album. It's just really great to listen to. Are we good to move on to the yeah. next song? Because the next song is uh, my favourite of the album. And it's like, it starts off being very not weird. Like it's 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 acoustic for like a lot of yeah, a lot of the song. I think. Um, and uh, the origin of this was uh, I think this was the first song they wrote for the album, um, and it was they they were kind of struggling with ideas, and then um, they were asked to write. Uh, mm. They were shown the last half an hour of Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet, and asked to kind of do the credit song for it. And obviously, the framework of the Romeo and Juliet story kind of makes up the the story of the song. Um, and uh, the the way this song went actually inspired the kind of rest of the album being the first one they wrote for it. Um, and that's why it's called Exit Music for a Film. And uh, the first time mm. I heard this song was at the end of the red, uh, not the, radio, what's about, the Black Mirror episode, uh, Shut Up and Dance, where it's used so mm. brilliantly. 
um, with the the kind of explosion happening with the big revelation of that episode. Um, so for me, that that this cost song, or I always thought about <laughs> the end of that episode of Black Mirror, which um, is one of the episodes that goes beyond just saying phone bad. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, um, and then, nah, nah, it's good. It, it's, it's it's a genuinely good show. There's bad episodes, but, <laughs> but uh, overall, it's a pretty. Is is, is it's Black a, yeah, Mirror? It's, just it's a pretty solid like show. Like, Charlie Brooke is like not too much of a boomer. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, is it, it's good. Little, but, Okay, okay. But, um... See, so yeah, this thing... So this... Archangel. <laughs> this is Doom of music. But, uh... Listening to oh, that... Oh, that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The song at the end of the episode just, actually... This is kind of funny. The whole album. So for the it's longest time, I just associated it with that. But then, eventually, as I uh, listened to it more and more, it just <laughs> took on the shape of Romeo and Juliet, the, the kind of Shakespeare story. Because it really... It really does follow the, that progression. And eventually, it's going to become its own thing mm. in my head. And I think the, the main reason I like it... like. You can, it is a bit long on the acoustics, but mm. it's that, that explosion that happens about two minutes mm. into it. That's, uh, yeah, you're it, talking about yeah. the moment where Johnny, the bass drops, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's my um, alarm to get up in the morning. <laughs> and what is really quite rare for a song like that is I have not started hating it yet. <laughs> wow. That is, yeah. yeah. It's just it's such a good drop, mainly because this is the song mm. that to that point had been so simple. And it brings in all of the kind of the the dread and the weird sounds, like the bass, the kind of almost unbearable sounds at times. It brings in the more like scre- like it's screechy amazing. vocals of Tom York, um, and it, it it kind of it's it's that collapse in Romeo and Juliet where like it don't want to spoil it for anyone, <laughs> but it's not going to mm. have the end. Um, and I think being at the credits of that film is really cool. Um, I think it's just such a good drop. I, I love it. It brings in the kind of the, the futuristic themes, it <laughs> kind of comes out of nowhere for this song. And they, I, I really do love the, that drop and how it makes the it just, the song is like building up to that point, and it just explodes with so much emotion and passion. It just it really is great. Um, I'm curious to see if you guys agree with me or if you hmm. uh, hate us. No, I, I really like this film. Yeah, it's one of the best on the album. I think initially it wasn't meant to be a credit song, it was meant to be elsewhere in the film. No, I, um, I quite like this I one. Guess. I can see that. Because, yeah, I think... Um, but because they, I think, ended up liking it so much, and it was like, yeah, we also want this to be one of the major things of our album, it sort of got booted to the credit, and so instead a, a different song took its place. Um, yeah, because I think initially they were shown two different scenes and had to like write for either one of those, and they weren't particularly feeling those. But Tom York did say uh, when I watched the last half hour was yeah when we saw the scene in which Claire Danes holds the Colt forty five against her head, we started working on the song immediately. <laughs> um, so yeah, it feels like they were very inspired by that moment there. Um, yeah, Greenwood said as well how uh, painstaking it was working on the Colts because um, they sort of had to really concentrate on it and sort of yeah, get it to work there was yeah, there was no going yeah that will do uh, looking how the chords run into each other and not being too long and boring i remember it making me really tired having to concentrate on that stuff so they uh, they did some real song making on this song <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i would i would completely agree um, with everything that's been said i i think it's one of the highlights of the album um Harry's right. That mm. moment where the um, where that just yeah, so was... fuzzy, distorted bass comes in, um, and then Greenwood's um, kind of delayed guitar riff just meets that as well, where they all just converge, and then you got the the small little drum fill before as well. It, it just really, really completes the song. Um, and I also think that it also has one of the best examples of of how York can sound so like ghostly at times. I can't really think of a better way of putting it, but he just has this really kind of fragmented feel um, to to his, to his vocals. Um, I, I think Screechy is a good way of putting it as well, mm. and I think he does this so well on um, Climbing Up the Walls, which is a song that happens later on the album, where just, I mean, the sheer energy mm. in his vocals, it's, it's, it borders so close to being unbearable, but, but it's just on the right side of that line that you can listen to it. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say, interesting enough, that I felt in the sort of starting songs, the, the vocals were almost like a bit too whiny for me. Whereas with, within within Exit Music, especially at the start, he was going for something a bit more gravelly, which I, I like yeah. the sound of more. Then when it goes a bit more a bit more strange around when the should drop we, happens. Uh, are we all done yeah, with yeah, I think thing. we should go on so, to yeah, uh, Ethan. I think it might be a bit pa- <laughs> <laughs> Harry, <laughs> Harry, you made the joke. Song. You made the joke. Oh, that's just me. <laughs> God. Yeah. The amount of time I do... build it. Wait, it's like the Thanos before the, before the sacred moment oh, happens. We teased it so many years ago. <laughs> um... <sighs> Damn. Oh, God. Can we just make the joke and then... <laughs> Harry, John is all yours if you want. We will have to. Okay, Tony's got to go now, even more. So we will come back for a second part. And no, finally we have to, it has to be. And we have to delay it even more. Joke. <laughs> no, right. oh, oh. dear lord. Okay, okay, I'll be right back. I want, I want you to be on the edge of your seats, lads. Okay, okay. This is what it's gonna be. <laughs> Worth it. Alright, stop it. Everyone quick? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm determined to start every podcast with the, the, the words everyone clicked. <laughs> it's it's not about us like syncing up our audio, it's it's just like the catchphrase of, of the podcast. That's what we'll everyone call the next clicked. podcast. Well, everyone that's, clicked. That's what... That's what you do when you when you watch, see a uh, a mediate video in your in your subscription feed. You click on it. So that's what we're saying to our audience: if everyone's clicked onto part two of uh, it's gonna be music so mates. The middle of this <laughs> oh, imagine if we uploaded them as separate <laughs> parts, though. Like, I, I was tempted to do that with the uh, Pokemon Gen three. Because I had to fuse two very long videos together, which took fucking ages. Um, so anyway, oh, well. letdown is the only letdown of uh, OK Computer, uh, <laughs> which isn't even da, true. Da, da, da. Not. I'm worried da, da, Ethan's da, da, not here. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's, because it's been so. <laughs> yeah, Ethan, are yeah, you there? I'm here. I was just waiting for you guys to, um, I guess, make the joke about letdown. And talk about it. <laughs> it was your joke, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, probably. I think it's no secret that it's for me. It's one of the weakest songs on the album. I'm not a massive fan. Not gonna lie. It's one of the strongest. What do you like about it, Jonathan? <laughs> I think it's one of the ones that really gets the kind of wisty sort of sound that I enjoy from uh, Radiohead. Um, and it's sort of, it's trying to pin a very interesting feeling, um, was what they were trying to do with this song. And there's a quote I quite like, which is, um, it's like hanging onto something and having the floors collapse underneath you, um, is how York has described this song, or the feeling he was trying to evoke. And I think he really does that with this song. It just massively holds the that sort of feeling to me. So... Yeah, it's one of those songs that can impress a feeling upon me. Hmm. See, for me, it's um, it's the song between Exit Music for a Film and Karma Police. And at this point in the album, what I really want to do is be listening to Karma <laughs> Police. And I guess that's why. I think it's one of the longer ones as well. I think maybe second longest after Paranoid Android. It's shorter ah, than okay. the tourist. Um. But yeah, no, it's the third longest song on the album. Um, yeah, so on my notes, I have written down, let down. The only let down of the album, except it isn't, it kind of slaps, which is true. Um, my, my feeling with let down is that it would be better suited to like the second half of the album. I feel like it fits more with that, like the overall tone of the second half. Um, and yeah, like Ethan says, the fact that it's between Exit Music and Karma Police kind of... Uh, doesn't help it much but i think it's great i think the themes of like almost being unable to settle is good and i like how the song generally like improves as it goes on um i get why people wouldn't like it because like 
maybe the first like verse is kind of slow um but i I love how it builds and builds and you kind of um you've got a very long bridge and the electronic sounds i think when when the song kind of returns from that bridge it's uh it's it's really cool and i think i think um it's one of the songs which i actually liked more as i looked into the lyrics um yeah and uh, it's got a pretty good ending as well yeah let down it's not a letdown. Yeah, I, I like the way it starts having harmonies laying over each other of the the vocals all from Tom York. That's an effect I really like when you have different layers of mm. of the vocals. There's a lot of songs in this album where like the it's it's a very unique sounds being played over each other, but you can't say it's like nice on your ears. But I feel like letdowns is very like, very mm. pleasant. So do any of you know um, Tony what the sound is at the end of the uh, song? The bleeping, what uh, what they use to uh, create that? I don't know. Nope. It's a ZX Besides Spectrum, that. which was an old computer uh, the band had. <laughs> Interesting. So what do you think about this song then, Tony? Um, I, I did not have many loads for it, other than that it's it's one of the more chill ones, which is why I, I think I might have to put a disagree with Harry on to, onto the fact that it would belong in the second half better, since I feel like the second half has the, the way more like upbeat songs, whereas this one's pretty, pretty, pretty lo-fi. Really? Um, I, think, I think the yeah. second half has... So where do you count the... Where's the split for you on the... Is uh, past, happier? fitter, happier. Yeah, because I think electioneering and climbing up the walls are like more experimental and like upbeat. But no surprise mm. is lucky in the tourist that like three kind of slow ones in a row. What do you guys uh, mean maybe, when you say a maybe. song is upbeat? Because I, I don't know if I would call any song on I this album like... upbeat. Well, what, what exactly do you mean? Tempo. I mean just like ha- has has ah, more okay. energy to okay. it, you know? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a faster tempo. Um, mm. you no, know, I think because like. Climb the, actually, Climb the Walls isn't, isn't even that high tempo, but it's ooh, quite ooh, tense. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll like get that? to those ones, but I don't know. This is this is, this is is the chill section. I, I think um, I've broken down uh, this this album into, like, emotional arcs, like in the same way that Neon Genesis Evangelion is broken down into, like, the action arc and the other arcs. I forget what they're fucking called. The good bit of the show. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say this is this is in the chill section, which uh, is from subterranean through to karma police. Which yeah, I, I, we I, could I, get I onto get if we have nothing. Yeah, else it's to a say shame. I wish that I would, I'd have had more to comment on it, but because it's one that I've listened to so infrequently, um, I only listened to it maybe uh, hmm. <laughs> probably about three or four times maybe in total compared to something like parallel android which probably in the hundreds at this point to be honest since i first heard it so (laughs) i don't think i know the song as well as you two um and i definitely don't it's probably the song that i know the least for sure out of all the tracks as well definitely so sorry it sounds like a weird recommendation but you should just skip a minute into letdown because it's it it is a much better song when you get into like the uh second verse Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Jonathan. I think yeah, um, that's kind of a I, I do like the harmonies um, that they come and layer in uh, from... Yeah, you know what, Harry? I think you're right. I think it's because it starts off slow, but then it never gains that momentum that I like with some of their songs. Maybe that's why I'm not really into it as much as um, the other songs, maybe. Oh, this is the one that they yeah they um, recorded this song in an orangery. Sorry, I'm just noticing random bits in my notes. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you go to a recording studio, the best thing you're gonna get is a kind of cliched video of people in the studio, you know. But if you set up in that <laughs> corner here, you'll always remember this room, and you'll be inspired by that plant or whatever. It brings a different sort of thing to it. It's Jonathan, did um, did you get the um the full yeah. quote that you um? That you mentioned about when you were first talking about the song, when you talked about the floor kind of opening up. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll read it out now because it is um, it is a very York thing to say. Um, so 
<laughs> I was pissed yeah. in a club and I suddenly had the funniest thought I had for ages. What if all the people who were drinking were hanging from the bottles? If the bottles were hung from the ceiling with string and the floor caved in and the only thing that kept everyone up was the bottles. <laughs> yeah, what a man. Damn. That's okay. <laughs> That's... Um, Johnny Greenwood said about this song, um, Andy Warhol once said he could enjoy his own boredom. Let down is about that. <laughs> it's the transit zone feeling. You're in a space, you're collecting all those impressions, but it all seems so vacant. You don't have control over the earth anymore. You feel distanced from all those that uh, all these thousands of people that are also walking down. I like that. Mm. As well as Andy Warhol just was like, <laughs> I enjoy my own boredom. <laughs> So I almost feel like it's it's almost uh, <laughs> that you sort of do find this song slow and sort of boring. It's like, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what they were trying. <laughs> <clears throat> should we uh, go on to Common Police? Yeah. We yeah. should. All right, should. go ahead, someone. Uh, I'll go first, because the only note I have is, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Because uh, I knew Ethan yeah. would want to talk about it. And to be honest, it's not it's not my favorite um, song on the album. I think it's pretty good. Um, the music video is really bad though. Um, it's just it's just Big Mad Andy, being <laughs> uh, <laughs> which kind of sucks. Um, well, I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that but, one. Uh, Barry, yeah, but, uh, but we'll get to that. I have nothing. I have nothing to say about this song apart from yeah, it's it's, it's good. Um, I don't think it's the highlight of the album. Like I think Ethan does one of the highlights. It's, it's pretty mid tier for me, but yeah, Karma Police. Arrest is now. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Harry with it sort of being uh, mid tier. The other thing is I've got to sort of say is how it's. Well, the chord progression is um, sort of taken from Sexy Sadie from, uh, well, the Beatles song. Um, and it's just a phrase basically that members of the band would say to each other a lot just, Karma Police will get mm. you. Um, so. I don't know, this, this song to me just feels like it's kind of like if we wrote a song about a meme line we often said to each other. It's, yeah, it just Music feels lines. like, yeah, it just feels <laughs> like a word salad to me. I don't know, I quite like the vocals in this. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd... I'd... <laughs> <laughs> Do you not have much more depth to add to that statement? It's just what it is. Uh, <laughs> um, can't believe I'm on all of these music mates. <laughs> a song. <laughs> Parts with noises were good. <clears throat> uh, should you see if you can just um, talk about the rest of the album just being like either <laughs> noises was good or noises was bad. Thing good or thing bad. <clears throat> Thumbs up or thumb down. Ethan. That's all you need, really. Ethan, come on, save, save me. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try just, my best. Just do it, come on. Karma um, Police was a, a song from this album that I originally didn't like very much, um, and I actually used to skip it, which it's surprising because it's one of the... Um, it's definitely, definitely one of the biggest hits from the album. It's one of the ones that people tend to know um, if they know anything about Radiohead. Um, but I think the more I listened to it, I... I gradually got into it um and i think well, i think one of the things i like a lot about it is i think all of the instruments really complement each other extremely well in this song um it, it has a moment towards the beginning that's kind of similar to that moment that we all like from exit music um which doesn't quite have the same weight mostly because it's at the beginning of the song in this case um, but it starts off with just an acoustic guitar and then all the instruments just come flooding in at the same time. And I think it has, um, one of the bass, one of the best bass drops on the album when it comes in, I think it just really completes the sound. Um, I, I found out that Tom York said, um, about the song kind of going off of what Jonathan, uh, already said is, uh, karma is important. The idea that something like karma exists makes me happy. It makes me smile. Karma Police is dedicated to everyone who works for a big firm. It's a song against bosses. The meaning apparent. Um, <laughs> and there's a really uh, cool story about uh, the music video, um, which I actually really like, and I've seen a couple of times now. Um, and it's uh, it consists of a POV shot from the point of a uh, car driver 
who's uh, chasing someone down a road at night uh, while York sits in the back seat and at regular points in the song, the driver kind of turns round and York is getting closer and closer to him until right at the end, um, the man that's being chased sets a trail of um, petrol on fire and then the car goes on fire and the driver looks back and York isn't there anymore. Um, and the director of the music video, a guy called Jonathan Glazer, um, originally had the idea um, when uh, Marilyn Manson approached him um, for a song that he had called Long Hard Road Out to Hell. And Manson suggested that he watch David Lynch's Lost Highway uh, for inspiration. And um, and you, d- you definitely have that. I- I've seen Lost Highway and w- one of the famous shots from the film is a car driving down the road and you've got the headlights and you just see the car as... Sorry, you just see the road. Ethan, do you know who Jonathan um, Glazer oh, is? Uh, Ex Machina, right? Under the oh. skin. Oh yeah, who am, who's who's Ex Machina again? Alex Garland. Alex yeah, Garland. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Under the skin. Damn, <laughs> I <laughs> completely <laughs> forgot about that. That's mad. Um. So yeah, is that what you were just going to say a minute before? Because I I heard someone try and interrupt me, and I kind of ignored. I just heard the name and was like. Shit, I know who that is. Yeah. What, you what else has Glazer done? Yeah, no, carry no, on. Sorry I, I... Uh, he did a sh- short film I saw that was quite good about someone like in a hole trying to get out. Nice. Um, let me search. I think he's done a lot of Radiohead stuff and a couple of features, but no, it's mainly just mm, under the skin. Yeah. Uh, Manson ended up rejecting the idea that Glazer came up with, um, and then Radiohead asked him if he'd do it for their uh, for their song, and um, I think. Tony said that he thinks um, he thinks the, the singing on this track is really good, and I, I definitely agree with him. Um, I think um, the lyrics are really, really strong. Uh, there are so many lines in this that are that are j- j- I think they just get stuck with you. And when I listen to Common Police, they are in my head all day. I just find them so catchy. Um, and I think um, I, I think it really sells this idea of of karma and kind of getting what what you deserve. Um, and there's this kind of fickle balance between um, good and bad. And I, I just think Karma Police just hones in on that completely and, and, and gets it spot on. And I think that's why so many people think it's one of the best songs on the album. Um, and yeah, I mean, instrumentally, I already talked about how the song is is really advanced in that way. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's a really good song, Karma Police. Um, I, I like it a lot now. <laughs> See, I just don't really get anything much from the the lyrics, or like no sort of meaning of karma, except maybe the this is what you'll get chorus. But the the verses are, as I sort of said earlier, just a kind of word salad to me. I, I, I don't know. I, I think I think York often I think York often goes for that. Um, I know in the verses there's lines about. Um, Lines about, um, you know, detuned radios and buzzing fridges and stuff like that. And, and sure, sure, it does have that about it, definitely. Um, mm. But I think I think it I think it's just very unique the way that he describes um, how he feels about things that to him are kind of meaningless in some way. Um, I, th- I think the way that he describes people just talking um, incessantly um, about something that doesn't matter to him in any shape or form um, is a lot in Karma Police. And I think when, when he talks about, um, I guess, Hitler hairdos and stuff like that, I think it's just, I don't know, I, th- I think it I think it creates quite an accurate picture for me. And from what I read as well, being a song against, against bosses and against, you know, authorities and uh, figures like that, I think he, um, I, I just think it's in the song, the, the meaning's there, if you ask me. Yeah, see, it, I, I see it a bit more now, but just to me, it, it sort of felt really detached and weird reading the lyrics. Oh yeah, it's it's against bosses. <laughs> it's like really, <laughs> you just don't seem to like this this person's hair. Um, well, I guess there is a line about we're still on the payroll. But I think it's because there is so sort of few lyrics, and it's just like a repeated phrase. It feels quite detached from meaning for me it just feels like almost an after the after the the thing just like oh yeah it's a it's a workers song against the bosses 
I don't know. I, I, I vaguely yeah. see I see where you're coming but, from yeah. as well, actually. Um, wh when did you first hear it, Jonathan? Do you know? Or how long ago it was? Uh, ages ago. I mean, I used to really like it. I've sort of grown off it a bit. Yeah, you know, I, I have the exact um, same um, experience with that you have with this song, uh, but with no surprises. Where it used to be um, one of my, we'll get onto it in a minute, um, sure. But it, no surprises, it used to be one of my favourite songs from the album, and it was because it was like Paranoid Android, one of the ones that I already knew going into it. But then you listen to more of the album, and a lot more songs appeal to you more, and then they kind of the ones that you used to know uh, going into it don't feel quite as as good anymore. I guess that might be a similar sort of thing for you with Karma Police. Possibly, yeah. Anyway, I think that's probably enough about. Yeah, we should points. probably speed up in general. Get yeah. get on to the one we've been waiting <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> uh, I have nothing really to say about fitter, uh, fitter, happier. Um, it's. I mean, I. I like the lyrics, but I hate the robot voice, and it is too unpleasant for me to listen to. Um, that, that, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I feel like fitter, happier. I I appreciate what they were going for, because sure, it's I I, I wouldn't even really call it a like much of a song. It's not a song. But I, but yeah, I think it. I think it's more some sort of weird performed poetry thing but that doesn't mean that it doesn't serve a good role in the album of being like a like a weird like jump start for the for the second half which i quite like mm. yeah I and, I, and i no go on i just think it i just think it 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 also while while being a bit on the nose i i do appreciate the um the uh the thing it's trying to convey you know the uh fucking 21st century hellscape vibe that we now live in uh for mm -hmm. this sort of i don't even know how to sum it up in words in 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 a concise way but just the just just the way that things are is this song you know yeah i think i think tony yeah. nailed it um like I, I don't see it as a song i see it as almost like a skip like a lot of albums Especially like bad rap albums have like comedy skits in between songs, which is like, <laughs> which is like I, I I often delete them from my phone. Um, but uh, no, this is a good like when I listen to the album, I'm, I never skip this song. I think it I think it helps the overall tone. Um, mm. it's, it's it's a great piece of poetry. I think I think um I used to hate it, but it's it's really grown on me. There's some absolute like gems of lines, some that they just stole from other places. Um, uh, I yeah I really like Fetter Happier, obviously. We could analyze it like a poem and like fucking parse it, but like we don't have time for that. And we could probably move on to like actual songs. But yeah, I um like Tony said about the two halves of the album. I've got that written down here. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's essential to the flow of OK Computer in my mind. I um mm -hmm. I agree with most everything that's been said. Um, I yeah I think I think Tony did like you said Harry hit the nail on the head. Um, it's not a song that not a song. It's not a skit. I guess we'll now say. Um, that I ordinarily would listen to. Um, I almost always skip it because the robotic voice um, does just cause my ears to bleed just a little bit too much. Um, so I normally skip it, but I... It's kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, there is something very nightmarish yeah, about it, but it, it's it's so difficult to listen to and enjoy, um, apart from just an appreciation for the poetry aspect of it, which you mentioned. Um, but it's so unappealing in how it actually sounds tonally. That I always skip it, but I wouldn't take it off the album at all because, as Tony said, you're right. It's 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 part of it's part of the texture of the album. It's it's part of the world building. Fitter happier is definitely a really important thing to have mm -hmm. on OK Computer. It just feels it's such a low effort way to express those ideas. Like it's a like I don't know because it is. Is yeah, it's, it's on the nose. It's on I, I think it's low effort now because you just you type it into a text to speech. But I think in 1997, um, it would be a lot harder to do like a like a robot voice like this to emulate it. I think more, yeah. it's more the fact that this album, like, kind of not predicted, but like for I don't know what I'd say, 
it knew that the kind of like we'd have like the Siri and Google. I mean, the the other albums with OK Computer, and that's how you talk to things. And now it's kind of mm. mad. And I think it's it's emulating a thing that we've like grown up around a lot more. I think I think for yeah. the time, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't call it like a lazy way to express it. But uh, I mean, you can feel like that. It's just I don't, I don't know. I think I disagree with the fact it's like an easy way of coming of putting these words out there. Well, it's, it's more just that it is just it, it's yeah it's a red poem yes they've taken it through some like level of some sort of post production editing that was harder at the time than it was now but it does still just feel like you you can do more with these ideas or I don't know that's I I I'm done with a bit of happier yeah. <laughs> I, I I will say that. To, to bring it back around to music videos and just I wonder if it's his key um, uh, to bring it back around to music videos the um, it, it, the robot voice reminds me of the part that comes in the middle of the Daikon 4 animation thing that I showed you guys a while ago and I, just, I just thought that was neat just remind me of that anyway we can get on to electioneering now right yeah Tony first song on the album do you want to start us off all right, all right. So if 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 we go if we're consi- uh, continuing the Neon Genesis Evangelion <laughs> metaphor, um, Fitter Happier is like the weird, strange episode where you have your your backstory like flashback thing while you're being dissolved or whatever. But this <laughs> like this is now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the one time that happens. <laughs> um, this is now this is now Shinji getting in the mech with uh, renewed resolve to talk about uh, the flaws in the uh, in in the democratic system. Um, uh, I think I think this is definitely one of the better ones, and I I kept I kept thinking that with the uh, second half songs. It's like oh, this is the best one so far. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out that uh, being being on the nose, called about electioneering, you see the you see the political tilt they're going for, and also also there's a little there's a little cowbell <laughs> beat in this song that I picked up. At least it sounds like a cowbell to me. And I was like, you know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the cowbell from Rage Against the Machine. So I like what they're doing here. I like what they're doing here. That's that's my notes. Retire the cowbell. Well. Yeah, so some of my notes I've got from this song is the opening uh, reminds me of Firefly, the sort of kind of sci-fi western sort of screeching. Um, I think, um, just... Johnny, not to kind of stuff in so much, I think it sounds like the pe- the uh, opening theme of Peep Show a little bit. I don't know. I've I've always thought like um, I guess it's got that sort of the chorusy thing. Sounds like the the Peep Show uh, song. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean as well. Yeah. Anyway, go back to doing your <laughs> yeah, analysis. So the 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 intro reminds us a lot of good things, um, and then the sort of I, I just love the kind of beautiful disharmony throughout this this song, the kind of metallic screeching guitar that just somehow works. Um, hmm. Yeah, the the energy as well that is that goes throughout this song is. I feel like much needed in this this album that does a lot of just being dreary and sad and long and, and listing, which, you know, there's some of the best songs on this album are like that, but you can't have 12 songs on an album be like that. And this does a very good job of sort of mixing it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. Ethan, do uh, you want to yeah. come in? Um, I'll read up. So I'll... In fact, no, actually, Harry, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Uh, I'm looking for a message you sent me, Ethan, uh, to, to to quote it kind of verbatim. But basically, you messaged me being like, "Can you talk about uh, Tony Blair?" I was like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> so this is the this is the Tony Blair song. Um, so I, I don't like looking in lyrics too much, but I, I had a glance and I hear I said it was inspired by Tom York reading some Chomsky. I'm like, "Well done, Tom. Uh, it's good. Pra- good <laughs> praxis." Um, yeah. Um, so basically, this album came out in 1997, which is the year that Tony Blair was elected. And uh, Tony Blair was leader of the Lead Party for 10 years, from 1997 to 2007. And I don't know if I've gone on record in the podcast of saying this, but it's definitely something I've, I've mentioned a few times. 
Uh, I think that the Blair years, culturally, are some of the weirdest of all time. Like, um, you, it's pretty much split down the middle, like, pre-post-9-11. But if you, like, analyze, like, early 2000s culture, it's just weird. Like, OK Computer mm. was, like, there before. This, this kind of, like, weird, like, proto-early internet, um, mu- like, tacky music videos, like, a weird era for music in general, uh, pop-wise. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a strange time. And then the culture shock of 9-11... And then, like the paranoia, and uh, the, it, it, I mean, nine eleven changed everything, and it's it's like right in the middle of this weird cultural period. Uh, but electioneering is a great song <laughs> if it's if it's about yeah. um, it's apparently it's about them doubting New Labour. But knowing how albums are produced, I highly doubt that like it factored much into it. I feel like the fact that they might have just like had glimpses of Tony Blair, um, also the fact that Radiohead would have been like born and raised during Thatcher. And then would have been like predominantly having their music career during major. So I guess that um, kind of some of the more like revolutionary ideas from the song come in from just being like raised like through like quite harsh story governments in their lifetime. Um, mm. But yeah, I think I think there's definitely like a doubt for like the, the promises that were coming up with the kind of kind of neoliberal uh, agenda of uh, of um, Tony Blair and uh, them kind of like like doubting it and wanting more. And uh, obviously, mm-hmm. as their kind of albums progress, they get like more and more political Radiohead. Um, I mean, it's a meme that like then like I think it's like, "Hail to the Thief" is just about like George W. <laughs> Bush's entire album. Um, and uh, and they were like an early adopter of like putting music online and like changing like the economic model for how to distribute albums. So uh, Radiohead, you know, they're, they're pretty cool, and this is a pretty good song. Um, I just want to say that this and the next one, which are the most experimental. I'm guessing Tony's favorite two songs in the album, maybe. Um, yeah, like, yeah, I think I think it's interesting that like Tom York's voice through the choruses of both is almost kind of un. You can't really understand what he's saying. And it's, yeah, yeah, I get, yeah. I got that a bit. It's, it's I a mean, lot... I. No, yeah, you I think feel... someone. Uh, sorry, someone said it earlier that it's it's more the thing that you pick up is like the one repeated chorus line. So, so for actually, it's like the electioneering bit where he says that over and over again. You go back, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and like same that. with uh, no alarms and no surprises, mm. and that's coming up later, you know. Yeah, this this this, this kind of electioneering and climbing up the walls is definitely like more of what they do. Where Tom York, like that, you've got the repeated chorus, and then unless you look up the lyrics, you won't actually know. But the lyrics are often like, yeah. very like on the nose about what the song's about. Um, mm-hmm. But it's almost like his his voice is becoming an instrument. Um, it, mm-hmm. and which kind of contributes to like the, the insane soundscape that creates the kind of tone of the song, which is um, what I kind of like about uh, this song, and even more in electioneering actually. Not electioneering, climbing up the walls. The, the other one. <laughs> things I also um, enjoy uh, with the Strokes is how I feel. Um, is it Julian Casablanca. His voice also kind of blends in so well with the the rest of the instruments uh but strokes uh, <laughs> um they, yeah, they have that similar sort of playing between vocals and, and guitar but they're much cheerier and poppier so um but yeah going back to just being uh, him being sort of unintelligible for large sections when looking up the lyrics and i was like wow he says i trust i can rely on your vote a lot and i did not hear that at all in the many <laughs> times i've listened to this song <laughs> It's in the mix. It's on those things like when when something's been subtitled, um, you can hear it. I find that with a lot of Radiohead's music. If you watch it with uh, like w- reading the lyrics along, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> he's been saying that the whole time. Anyway, Ethan, was that enough notes about? Uh, yeah, about yeah, that was. You? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> yes, you have I do. More, um, um, I, I don't think I have much say. more because yeah, you guys have definitely. Um, talked about all the stuff that i would have probably wanted to talk about and i completely agree i think this song's fantastic one of the strongest points on the album um i can't really talk about climbing up climbing up the walls because i have such an i have such an experience with that song listening to it um that i don't really have with other songs so i can't wait to talk about that in a minute um with electioneering i'll talk about something really quickly um it yeah it's so it's a quote about uh, chomsky and um and other stuff um so york said he'd begun reading work by um him and I quote, like a lot of songs I write, it came from two places at once. I had this phase I went through on an American tour where we just seemed to be shaking hands all the time. And I was getting a bit sick of it and upset by it. So I came up with this running joke with myself where I used to shake people's hands and say, I trust I can rely on your vote. They'd laugh and look at me like I was a nutcase. But the phrase sort of carried on. It was like a mantra. Um, 
And I think that was that's kind of going what um, you guys were saying about not knowing some of the lines because they're so kind of incoherently sung. <laughs> it's, it's interesting though, because that was the the fifth note I have is just the line I trust I can rely on your vote, and that was how I was just planning on like ending our talk on this was just to say to you guys I trust I can rely on your vote. There's just something about that phrase that is it just works to be said a lot for no <laughs> particular reason. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of it's one of those uh, politician mm, sayings that just yeah. kind of means nothing, but you just say yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll also say really quickly that um, I think what electioneering does so well um, that kind of le later songs by Radiohead don't do as well is that it has the experimentation going on it, hundred percent, and you have these really really brilliant sounds to listen to. But the thing that that, ma that makes you want to listen to it rather than their later work is there's there's a melody to it. It's not just sound for the sake of sounds. There is this kind of there is a rhythm to it that is driving the song forward, and and that's all you need for for a good song for me. It has these two janky guitar parts um, leading the rhythm that go hand in hand throughout the entire song, and they work so well together considering they're both you know really really fuzzy, and um, and shouldn't be pleasing to listen to, but but they just are. And um, when we talked earlier about how electioneering is really energetic, and I definitely agree with that. It's one of the more fast paced songs on the album. I think that's why it appeals to me a lot as well. It has this kind of almost has a punk feel to it at times. It's its pace is so just relentless. Mm -hmm. And and the yeah. drums pounding away really help that, that drive just feel insistent. Um, and I, 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 yeah, really, really solid song. Um, definitely love listening to it a lot. Cool. Should we uh, move on to climbing up the walls? Yeah. Oh, are we good to go? There will be blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I trust. I can rely on your vote. Yeah. Go on, Harry. Can you go first? Well, climbing up the walls ends with the beginning of yeah, there will be blood. It, it, it uh, <laughs> which is... <laughs> Which is great. So you, you, you can listen to Climbing on the, up the Walls and just lead perfectly into there will be blood. Um... <laughs> Uh, I don't have anything else to say about it. It's a good song. Um, I, it's, it's, again, it's hard to understand the lyrics. The vocals are very distorted. Um, it's a weird soundscape. At times, it's actually a little bit unpleasant. But um, overall, I think I think it's, 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 it's a very cool song. Probably the weirdest mm. in the album. Uh, well, I mean, that's the one. Yeah, it's a good song. See, I enjoy the beginning, and I think it really gets this sort of great feeling of dread. But I just feel like it sort of loses it and doesn't really have anywhere to go with it by the end. Johnny, it goes to Daniel Plainview <laughs> in the silver mine on his own. That's yeah, where but it it's goes. not Daniel Plainview. It's like a stop animation of Woody from Toy Story. He's just chipping away in that mine shell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That video. Great video. <laughs> so you were saying about <laughs> climbing up the wall? Yeah. Uh, if if I can come in and say I really like the uh, the start of this, um, this is where I, I kind of get what people say when when they talk about Radiohead being like a like a sort of experimental weird sort of thing band because you know you get this this sort of like warp effect on on the voice which I really like um, and also fear fear happier is also mm. sort of a song on the album that kind of gave it away as well. Um, <laughs> This is this is where I sort of understood like the appeal of the the voice a lot more than I didn't in the earlier prologue arc of the uh, of the album. Um, and I think I think almost almost disagreeing with Jono here that it's 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 it when he says it doesn't go anywhere because I feel this is this is like a song that starts off with like a pretty pretty low intensity. And then it kind of sneaks up on you how 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 like powerful it gets, uh, which I quite I think is pretty cool. I think that's pretty neat. There's that like bass uh, sound that sounds like it's like reeing at one point. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, almost yeah, overwhelming. Ah, uh, but I don't know. I kind of like it. I think it's just I was you know expecting it to climb higher up the wall, but it just <laughs> feels like it reaches the ceiling early for me. Um, like a football comment. I don't know. I I can't speak in like <laughs> non metaphors. Yeah. Uh, should I should I go next? Yeah. Ethan. Um. 
So I, I really love this song a lot. Um, I remember when I first listened to it, I listened to it again and again and again, just on loop because I love differently to Jonathan. I love the direction this song goes. I actually think that it carries on building and building and you get this really, really mm -hmm. epic conclusion. Um, this song I find genuinely scary to listen to. Um, we kind of had this, we sort of mentioned that you kind of get a dread as you're listening to it. And I definitely agree with that. I always get goosebumps um, when I'm listening to it. And especially right at the end when it just culminates into this almost um, operatic sound, it gets that intense. And um, it, it's kind of, it, it's, al it's almost like the end of Airbag, um, where when I'm listening to this song, I just get completely kind of absorbed and lost in it. And, I just don't really get that often with songs where I just feel like I am completely submerged by it. Um, I, I think it's partly because the, the group Radiohead are able to make something that sounds so full and so complete. And what they do is, is every kind of every sort of loose pocket of, of silence, they seem to somehow fill with sound. I, I don't know how they do it. And I, that's kind of an abstract way of talking about it. It just feels like, like the overall sound that you get just, just fills everything and it's just completely present in every way. Um, and I think the music at the end just comes together in this really um, amazing harmony. I think a lot of that is helped by the fact that Greenwood composed a, um, a string mm -hmm. section that was, uh, I think, 16 violins that comes in at some point into it. I think that really helps. Um, and I also get the same uh, feeling with the song that I get with... Um, a track off of Kid A, uh, one of the ones that I actually really like with everything in its right place, where I, I almost, it, it's so existential and transcendent at times that I, I feel like I'm practically drowning in just this ocean of just amazing sounds. And I just want to stay there a little bit longer, even if it's a, a depressing place to be. And I, I guess that's what I feel with the song and why I really like listening to it so much. Yeah. I, I definitely... So I... Go ahead. I've, I've realised now, because uh, I, I listen to these songs in the background once we start talking about them. Mm. So, yeah, it does... I think, yeah, so it builds up nicely for a song. But I think the problem I was finding was that because I was, like, reading about, you know, the <laughs> it being described as, yeah, um, Climbing Up the Walls is one of the first tracks by the band to be described as scary. Like, I was reading this as I was beginning to listen to the song. I was like, oh... This is going to go to a really interesting place then. Like, oh yeah, there's a bit of dread at this this first bit here. But to me, it just sort of built up into, oh, okay, it's some nice guitar riffs now. Like, that's what you built up to. So it loses any feeling of dread to me and it's just like, oh, it's just it's just a song. Um, which, I mean, it is what it is. I think it, it perhaps is a bit of an unfair marking on me. It's just like I was expecting something a lot more from the sort of ideas behind the songs and it never quite mm. reached that point to me um but yeah so like I'm, I'm ready to feel scared by it at the beginning and it doesn't go to that place for me it just sort of becomes but, but york's song. york's vocals towards the end are so kind of like <sighs> they're, they're so screechingly um invasive almost um, it's probably how I'd describe it, and I, I can't believe that that you don't that you don't get at least a little bit of that towards the end, where you feel like it just kind of tails off and doesn't doesn't really go um, where you wanted it to. Because I mean, his voice practically sounds like it's breaking apart towards the end. Like by the end of it, he's just going to be mute for the rest mm -hmm. of his life. Um, I, honestly, I, I just <laughs> I, I think the way that it starts off with just the this this acoustic guitar and a really really tinny drum just kind of an absence of, of of other sounds and then when they just come pouring in and the breakdown and then when it actually gets to the finale and when you get that last note and then all the sounds kind of trail off and just break away from each other um in the last maybe 20 30 seconds or so until you get that there will be blood exit right at the end um i don't know i i i just i just really like the direction that it heads I'm sorry, Jonathan. I'm going to have to disagree with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's... it. 
<laughs> this song never really I never really noticed it when listening to the album as a whole, and so I was only really listening out for it when I was having to write notes about things. And so I have really only had that one one time when I was writing the notes up and then like just now sort of properly listening through or I've kind of been concentrating on it. So I'll I'll admit I've not given it many chances, but but I have also listened to this album like um like in, in preparation for this mm. like, like we always do like and sometimes prepare like six months early by like, yeah. having listened to this album like this was what i listened to when i was walking to and from uni for like about a month so like mm-hmm. i've I've listened to this album a lot and this song has just never stood out to me so at the same <laughs> time i have also given this song a lot of chances um i don't know yeah uh, should we go on anyway yeah yeah i, would I think say we anything. made our points let, 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 let's have Tony speak. He's uh, been trying to speak sorry. for a while and so, had this argument. This is really out of date. Um, when you said earlier that it reminded you of the end of Airbag, I thought you were going to say it reminded you of the end of Evangelion. <laughs> I've not because... watched the show, Tony. I've not watched <laughs> I'm, I'm the show. I'm continuing this bit going. <laughs> I'm continuing it. Um, just because it has this really like haunted vibe to it, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you're sort of sort of transfixed by it. You know, you can't you can't turn your ears away, um, despite the fact that it fucking goes yeah. crazy. Well, I've not yeah, you haven't seen it. Tony, you're doing the thing yeah, that I that's do. That's my point. Well, I see, I watch something and then I just try and bring it up all the time because my mind's still <laughs> on it. Ha- but ex- that's except that you, happens, you yeah. haven't rewatched the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's fucking Neon Genesis Evangelion is the type of thing that just stays in your brain forever. You can't get it out. That Can't is true. Happen. I have been listening to the soundtrack a lot, even though it's like not that good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, and I've just got to continue the extended metaphor now at this point. <laughs> I've run out of ways to do it. <laughs> Fuck. And there are the no surprises the... that you'll bring up Evangelion again. And uh, now I've seamlessly yeah, transitioned, done. Ethan will be like, actually, can I say some more things? Nah, 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 I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. Climbing up the walls. <laughs> All right. No surprises. Um, it's, uh, I was surprised to learn um, that this is actually one of the the, uh, the most popular songs on the album when I first listened to it, because the first time it, it didn't it grab me that much. But um, yeah, it's, it's grown on me. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good song. And um, this is this is where I've written the note, just, just a razor head. Um, <laughs> Which I said I was going to explain, but I think it's always funnier if I don't. So I might just leave it at that. <laughs> so yeah, this is basically a, a ra- the film a razor head. But the, like, they're exactly the same thing. Um, yeah. I mean, my feeling is, I, I, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that this is a popular song. But then that's sort of, I don't know. Radiohead is a band for people who are wallowing <laughs> in their own depression, and this is one of the best songs for wallowing in your own depression. Um, it, just the sort of, uh, yeah, the the very sort of bleak lyrics it sort of has, um, sort of counterimposed with this almost, like, innocent mm. bell chiming sounds you've got going on. I th- yeah, yeah, I think um, it's, I think um, the song actually sounds okay. It, it's more that when you, like, the more you think about the lyrics, it's actually depressing. Um, so I, I think, I think you can read it. Like you, you, you as Tony said, with the end of Evangelion's ending, um, if you squint <laughs> really hard, you can see it being happy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that it is quite a popular song. Actually. I, I, I agree with Jonathan I, because, because of what he mentioned, but also, um, I, I think it's kind it's got quite a poppy sound actually. It almost has kind of a lullaby feel to it. Um, I think it's probably the best way of putting it. Mm-hmm. And with all the other songs on this album that have kind of harsher sounds that you, you, I guess you would probably need a bit more of an acquired taste to. This one is is so. If you if you put the lyrics to one side, it's a really pleasant song to listen to. So uh, I can. Com- it's no surprise, in fact, that it is a popular song. <laughs> so. Yeah, I kind of found it interesting when you said that, Harry, that you, that you didn't think... You were surprised to find out that it was um, one of their more famous tracks. Well, it's more that I just... I, I think that the early songs on this album, I, I talked to you... Maybe it's just because I, I don't know what people think and I only know what you think about music, Ethan. The, like, the, the first few songs. 
So when I was like on YouTube and I saw it, it had this the music video for No Surprises had like a hundred million views. I was like, <laughs> I did not see that coming. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, music video is it's the best one, but uh, it's also <laughs> not that good. It's just Tom York's face and Tom York's not that attractive. <laughs> So it's like, oh, okay, just staring at this guy with a weird eye. Yeah. Drowning. Isn't it him in this sort of like 2001 style space suit, and then it like fills up with water and he drowns, and then he comes back mm. again. Like, I've not seen this in years. Yeah. Uh, but that's yeah. Really yeah, that's it. Helmet. That's yeah. it. And that's the true. lyrics are appearing across the visor of his helmet um, as, as the song goes on as well. Yeah. Yes. I remember, um, yeah. I think I've already brought him up before on this on this particular episode as well in the first part. But I remember talking to Mr. Bruno once about his song a really long time ago. And, and, he, and he told me um, <laughs> that he found out somewhere that right at the end of the music video, um, when the water kind of exit at, exits out of his helmet, um, Tom York is smiling. And that's because they I think they'd done quite a few takes at that point and it was hard for him to hold his breath for that long and he was really happy that they finally got the take where he was able to hold his breath long enough um and that's why he's smiling and that kind of stuck with me i think um as the water comes down he's like singing the next lyric and um it reminds me of the bit in the lighthouse where willem dafoe is like delivering a monologue whilst having dirt shoveled <laughs> into his mouth and he just doesn't stop the monologue i was like the commitment to like be like drowning and like <laughs> well, obviously a lot of water is going into his mouth but he doesn't stop like the singing I'm like actually this is, this is, this is uh, good acting I see what you mean well done. I see what you mean mm. yeah um, but apart from that I, I, would say I don't really the, have, have much uh, more to say about don't, don't, it don't um, too many notes I think I mentioned earlier no that it used to be one of the ones that I really the liked and I actually the, uh, listened to the album it's the it's, it's not it's the, as, it's the as one that was stuck in my um, head after I had finished listening to the whole album but it's still quite decent so that's something about you know just the main the main again that re- that one. So um, uh, I mean, I guess we can line, move on if uh, if everyone's no talked. No surprises. If everyone said their part about no surprises, kicking about in my brain. Yeah. Pretty neat. Ah, okay. Mm. I think this score might be fucking <laughs> up <laughs> because I'm talking now and no one seems to be. I don't know if Ethan's talking. Uh, I think he might be. Ethan. Fuck. Oh no! Oh god, Tony. Um, I thought we were gonna have no surprises. <laughs> Tony, if no surprises was a character from the Genesis Evangelion, uh, who would it be? Uh, I forget his name, but what's the name of that guy that Asuka has a has a has a crush on? Oh, he's that's, a cool guy. Like the as older well. guy. Is it Mr. Kaji? Him. Yeah, something like that. Him, I think. I think he would be no surprises. Yeah, although yeah, that character does have a lot of surprises. Yeah, Ethan. Yes. Do you want to talk well, about no the surprises? Thing is, I was talking about no surprises, and then I realised that Discord was fucking up. So I basically just talked about it, and then realised probably none of you three can hear me. And I left the call and joined back, and you were talking about Neon Genesis Evangelion. All right. Well, you know what's going to happen is Harry's going to insert that conversation you had right now. Nah, I'm not. I'm just going to have us all talking over each other. <laughs> wow, Ethan. Those all are right. some real, real great points about no surprises. <laughs> Lucky we got to hear them. Hey, that's the name of the next song. <laughs> I'm so glad we started this bit after we got to the fucking subterranean, subterranean alien song, whatever that's fucking called. <laughs> Subterranean. Tony, sub, sub, what do you think about Lucky? Prospecting days on Subterrell. Um, Wait, yeah, actually, this, this one is... No, no, can I go first? Because I've just realised right. I've got the best note. Okay. And I've only got you one can, note about can. this song. Um, so, this song starts with a line, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, I can't not think about Johnny's joke from his book. Um, that's my only note. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> Nice. I I steal the show on a review of a of a Radiohead song. You yeah. You're you're you are the best thing about this song, Johnny. All right, Tony. You can go now. Okay. I I like that. This is um. Uh, this is like a nice chill one to to end on again. This is the the the. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher a French word. The denouement of the um of the album. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and um, 
And yeah, it's nice and chill. This is one where I really quite like the guitar off as well. Um, just a nice, nice that the album sort of slows down towards the end after having some some pretty strong bangers with electioneering and climbing up the walls and no surprises. Anyone else? Uh, this song sort of flicks between more sort of like calm moments and then sort of more like a sudden burst of more intense guitar. Yeah. Um, I think this has some of the more interesting lyrics of the ones I like sort of read through all of these. Or just, I really like the line that is, pull me out of the air crash, pull me out of the lake, because I'm your superhero. Just the sort of, it's the it's superhero. It's just airbag again. Yeah. Does the rescuing. <laughs> it's not the same, like, it's like the same song as airbag. Yeah, yeah. But my final note on this song is just Tom York is not <laughs> traveling, um, which is understandable. But yeah, all right. But yeah, I feel with with that line especially, it sort of does because I mean, these <laughs> lucky and airbag is sort of about the weirdness of how you know being close to death is sometimes the thing that makes you feel the most alive, and also with this sort of lyric of like rescue me because i'm the the hero that needs to rescue other people so it's like but then the superhero is the character that would be pulling the person out of the aircraft or the lake sort of turns things on its head a bit i feel like the whole interstellar burst back to save the universe thing is like a more succinct way of saying the same thing though you just like you just did the same song again but worse in my opinion that kind of uh ruins lucky for me hmm no, I... I've got a problem with this song that I'm um, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll get into my true feelings about Lucky now. Where if in three months you asked me write out every track to OK Computer in order, I would be able to do it, but I wouldn't remember the name of Lucky um, <laughs> because for some reason as well I wouldn't remember how the song goes. Because as, as much as I don't hate the song, so what I just would you write? Would it, it just be Airbag kind of Two Point I just wouldn't have anything. <laughs> I just wouldn't know the name of the song or how it went. Um, I think it's because a it's like the same it's got the same meaning as airbag basically a very similar one and b it serves the same purpose as being like a chill song as the tourist but um it's it's worse than the tourist so um yeah I I, I don't really like, I'm not a big fan of Lucky I think if I was to make my perfect version of the album I'd get rid of Lucky altogether um move let down to after election uh, after climbing up the walls um and yeah that, that that's that's my perfect version of OK Computer. But uh, yeah, I, I I think Lucky is probably the worst song for me. Hmm. Um. I I think it's pretty good, actually. Um. I think maybe after after Let Down, the weakest one for me is Forest, and I still think it's a pretty decent song. Um. The the best part of Lucky for me I, will have to be the um the chorus. Um. And it's because it feels so ethereal to listen to. Um, it kind of has this really dreamy sort of. <sighs> it has this really dreamy feel about it that I really, really like listening to. And I, yeah, like Tony said, it's it's really kind of nice and chilled out and laid back, um, and it, it makes me happy when I listen to it. And um, I've got a fact here about um, about the song. Um, it says it was inspired by a weird high pitched chord that um, Ed O'Brien played on his guitar while the band were touring for the Benz back in nineteen ninety five. And then they fully fleshed it out for the um, charity album um, that I talked about in the intro. And it didn't do quite as well as they'd wished in raising money, but they still gave a decent effort. Um, I think it's a pretty good song. I, I do like it. I do like it. Oh, yeah, I think it, it, I, I'd say it is one of the weaker ones on the album. It's, it's the effect it has uh, on the chorus that sort of saves it for me. But yeah. I, I've never disliked it when listening to it. It's just got a weird thing where it leaves my head. I don't know what it is. It's just it just doesn't stick. Uh, I'm not sure if that's mm. just because the way the song's designed, it's, it's got like. Jonathan, do you think know. that the um, verses of this song sound a lot like Muse? At all? Did that ever cross your mind? In fact, was there any song on this album um, that made you think of Muse a lot at all? No, I I see what you mean. Yeah. It, it does i mean that's mm. that's sort of what muse is it's yeah sort of well, the, well they often get um yeah. they often get slagged off quite a lot by i think massive radiohead fans they just sort of 
are a poor person's version of of Radiohead, um, which is I think it's kind of unfair. I, I think Muse are unique enough to label as their own band. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's unfair. They, yeah, they take it in a direction that is more on the sort mm. of pop side mm. of the kind of Radiohead sound, which um, I know sometimes, uh, well, <laughs> sometimes describing things as like pop is a is an insult to them, but I. I don't know. I think it, it creates enough of its own niche out there. I, I think Muse has got some really strong yeah. songs and albums. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to be honest, I probably listen to Muse more than Radiohead. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. I think in um, in episode six of Neon Genesis Evangelion, um, <laughs> Ray was pretty lucky to destroy the angel Ramil with that sniper shot. Because um, the odds of that that move uh, actually working were pretty low, if I remember. Uh, so, yeah. Jonathan, have you have you watched any of the show that they're constantly talking about? I watched the first two, three episodes. Mm. I mostly just remember a penguin and a uh, great scene where they like move something off a table, and there was a can in the way that blocks your view. Um, that that's mostly what I remember. I think I think it, it's it's fitting. There's something about Neon Genesis Evangelion and Radiohead and us doing a podcast that all sort of overlap in that weird center Venn diagram way. Just feels like it fits. I think Evangelion and OK Computer do have a lot of similarities in fairness. Yeah, they are they are both they are both like as 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 Jono said for people who are really depressed. <laughs> and it kind of, it kind of is, is about that catharsis, I guess. Same time period, really popular for some reason, even though they're like both a little bit too weird to be as popular as they are. Um, yeah, um, and the tourist is really about like it's it's the final song on the album. It's it's a, I think it's a pretty great song. Um, it's maybe a little bit too long, but it's you know it's about slowing down. And I feel like if we're following yeah. the emotional arc of this um, album, you know, so like. You gotta just take a step away from the modern world, and like uh, just, just mm-hmm. clear your head and slow down. I think it's a really good message to end on, and I think Shinji Ikari could have, um, if the angels weren't attacking <laughs> all the time, he could have done with slowing down a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think it, it's it's good as a final song for doing that kind of like contemplating time and sort of looking looking through things. Uh, it doesn't mean <laughs> I have to like it though. Um, yeah, I'd never listen to the tourist on its own. But yeah, it's a good end note. Yeah, I, I enjoy how this. So this song was written by uh, Johnny Greenwood, um, and so it was the only one I noticed not being by Tom York. But I still enjoy that York did a lot on this song as well, and uh, most of the quotes are about what York thinks about the song. So I just get the feeling that just like any member of the band is just like. Oh, I've got this idea for a song, and then just immediately Tom York is like, <laughs> "Yes, we'll do this." It's like Tom, Tom, Tom. It was my my idea. What a brilliant idea I've just had, everyone. Like, oh, okay, okay, Tom, you you do it. You write the song. Yeah, um, I think I. Hmm. It, it's it's a good song. Maybe as a finale, I'm a little bit let down, but it's no let down, so I'm not complaining. Um, <laughs> let down. So much I, I think it's 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 really quite uh, again agreeing with Harry that the whole the emotional arc of ending on on just telling you to slow down because um, again as I mentioned earlier I was like I was like looking for in these songs for like either something to be really chill or something to be really upbeat. And for for the song to very on the nose be telling me like slow the fuck down, you know, um, I'm like okay, fair enough. Point taken. <laughs> point taken. Um, and it's it's pretty funny though as well the like nice contrast between the sort of lo-fi kind of vibe of the instrumentals, but also the fact the voice has a lot of power to it as well as it's telling you to telling you to mm. in fact slow down. Yeah, I like I like the idea that a, that a lot of the album is about. Nice trying to frantically catch up with um, a world that you feel is moving a lot faster than you are. And then you kind of have to tell yourself, right, right. At this point, you kind of need to slow down a little bit, just take it one step at a time kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it definitely does work really well. 
I think, in that point, lyrically as a finale. Um, I think maybe more musically, I don't know, I sort of expected more from a final song and not just five minutes um, as, as, a, um, as a song length. But I don't know, I, I guess something just a little bit extra that I don't think it fully delivers on. It really is yeah. the Andre Tarkovsky <laughs> song. You know, it's just on the day to day. That's the point, I guess. Yeah. Should we, uh, yeah? Should they have smashed some things with a golf club <laughs> at the end? I think so. I think so. Um, who wants to go mm. first? I think the normal thing is that I give my first rating as a bar. Should we do that? Yeah? Yeah. Um, so overall, this album went up in my estimations quite a bit since I first listened to it. Um, I, b- before I kind of got into Radiohead a lot more, I used to just listen to um, a few songs from Pablo Honey and the Benz because they were the albums that my parents liked. And they often warned me about OK Computer, actually, and told me that I'd be a bit disappointed with um, mm-hmm. how highly rated it is as a Radiohead album. But um, thanks to Johnny, I listened to Paranoid Android and loved it so much that over time I kind of felt the need to sort of explore the rest of the album. And there are some tracks in this album that will stay with me for a really, really long time. And it is definitely now comfortably one of my favorite albums. And I think before this podcast, I would have probably given it a nine, but I think I will bump it up to a 10 now. Um, And I'm glad to call myself a Radiohead fan. Thanks, Tony. Congratulations. 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 Um, Who wants to go next? <laughs> Tony, do you want to go next? Uh, I, 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 um, I'm, I'm, I'm dipping between two scores. So I'm giving it an extra 30 seconds of thought if someone else wants to go. Um, I can go because my rating's pretty easy. Um, yeah, I mean, I've made no secret. This is my favourite album. Uh, so, yeah, this is, this is a 10 out of 10 for me. Um, yeah. And Neon Genesis Evangelion, uh, I think it's a little bit better than Evangelion, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that on every other podcast we're going to do. <laughs> so this is the, this is Ethan. This, this is show. the new letdown, Ethan. Tony. Ethan, oh my god! The best part is Ethan doesn't even know that this is the second time we've done an extended Neon Genesis Evangelion metaphor <laughs> through a podcast since we did it in Gen Three earlier. <laughs> Yeah, that was on me as well. But I like the fact that we've lost the running letdown jokes. The new running joke has to be yeah, Evangelion until we Jonathan. have reviewed on the show. We're just going to be for like Jonathan, we've got to find um, something that we both <laughs> right. watched and then just constantly reference it on every podcast from now on. <laughs> so, you know, oh my god, The Last Kingdom is one show, of the best. Isn't it? you know, especially the, yeah, the final that part season. where Uhtred, son of Uhtred, <laughs> tries to take Bevenberg back. Oh, I don't like... <laughs> but the bit where he's the son of Utrid, um, absolute. What's that one scene that you always make? What, the Ben and Barley scene? <laughs> Who are you making? You yeah, want? that's the one. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Yeah. Uh, right, I'm on the fence between giving this album an 8 or a 9. Um, I'm on the fence. And I, I, no, I don't. Mm, I, I think I'm going to settle on an 8. Um, I feel like initially when I was sort of first listening to this like months ago in preparation for this, I might have given it a nine, but it's sort of gone down since then as I've not mm. been in a Radiohead mood. <laughs> so it, it can fluctuate between you, those do, two, but uh, you know, this current time. Do you think you would eight. have, um, you'd give the Benz a higher rating if we'd done that on the podcast? Yes, but whether that's just because I can't remember the songs that I think are weaker from the Benz. Um, because at the moment, you know, all I can remember from the Benz are the songs I like and would rate very highly. But I, I think I do prefer mm. Benz as a whole. I, I think, think I I will agree with Jono giving this an 8. There's, 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 um, it's kind of strange, this album, right? <laughs> if, if you hadn't noticed. Um, it definitely took me for some getting used to, because in the in the prologue arc with Airbag and Paranoid Android, wasn't really sold on the singer's voice, um, but it, it 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 comes into its own. I feel like it's kind of a shame almost that uh, 
the album feels like it's such like a cohesive thing on its own, right? It tells like this old this old story, but I really just want to butcher it. Take like all right, the the couple of songs I like that are really upbeat and put them in like an upbeat music playlist. Take the couple of songs that are really chill and lo-fi and put them in a fucking lo-fi <laughs> beats to relax slash study to uh, playlist, which feels kind of sacrilegious. But oh well. Nah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's what <laughs> like things like Spotify are for, right? Yeah, 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 I guess, I guess. I don't know. They just, it's like they do fit well together, though. Yeah, I think the they do. But you can't com- even argue it's against the artistic intent because this album like had singles and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose, I suppose. And I <laughs> will leave fitter, happier <laughs> off anything. <laughs> Like that goes in your like oh, beat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that just comes on as I'm like trying to run at the gym or something. More Fitter, productive. Happier. More productive. Anyway. I think I think now that we've uh, learned to visualize ourselves within <clears throat> our own hearts, um we can uh we can move onwards. Uh, is is are we cut it out now? Thanks for watching, guys. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> this is such a just 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 an end of just like ah uh, yes that's that's it just 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 ending. It's all just kind of dropped out. <laughs> Damn.